Hi everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com and supported by this amazing AI study tool called Wisdolia. At the end of this session, I would be providing you with the link for the practice sessions so that you can solve multiple choice questions and you know, answer clinical scenario based questions based on the topic which I'll be discussing now. And the topic of today is diabetes mellitus. Starting from today, this is a series on diabetes mellitus and this is the part one of this series where we will be learning about the general aspects of the endocrine pancreas. We will see how diabetes mellitus is defined, the epidemiological aspects and what is the criteria for diagnosis of diabetes mellitus and then finally we will understand how diabetes mellitus is classified. Firstly, before we uh, you know, understand the concepts of diabetes mellitus, let us see, uh, let's learn about pancreas. We all know that the pancreas is a long flat gland which is located in the abdomen behind the stomach, right? So, it extends horizontally from the duodenum to the spleen. And we know that pancreas has both endocrine and exocrine functions. In the context of diabetes mellitus, we should be knowing about its endocrine functions, right? So, what is this endocrine pancreas? This basically is, you know, a collection of clusters of cells. There are around 1 million clusters of cells and these are referred to as islets of pancreas or pancreatic islets. Now, these pancreatic islets contain cells which can be of major cell type and secondly, minor cell type. There are four major cell types and two minor cell types. What are these four cells? They are beta cells, alpha cells, delta cells and PP cells. Whereas the minor cell types include D1 cells and enterochromaffin cells. What are these beta cells? These are the cells which produce insulin. We know that insulin regulates glucose utilization in tissues thereby decreases blood sugar level. Whereas alpha cells are the ones which secrete glucagon. It stimulates glycogenolysis in the liver. Thereby there is increase in the blood sugar level. Right? In terms of their function, beta cells and alpha cells are opposite in nature. Right? Now, moving on to the delta cells which secrete somatostatin. This is the hormone which suppresses both insulin and glucagon release. So, very important for the regulation of you know, insulin and glucagon by beta cells and alpha cells. Whereas PP cells are the ones which secrete pancreatic polypeptide. They stimulate gastric and intestinal enzymes. So, these are the major cell types of the islets of pancreas. The minor ones are D1 cells which secrete vasoactive intestinal polypeptide in, in short form it is referred to as VIP. It induces glycogenolysis and thereby hyperglycemia. And the last one is enterochromaffin cells which secretes serotonin. These are the ones which might result in tumors causing carcinoid syndrome. Right. So now you need to remember beta cells, alpha cells, delta cells, PP cells. So, these are the cells beta, alpha and delta which are directly involved in the levels of blood sugar. Right. Now, what is this diabetes mellitus? Let's learn about the origin of the word diabetes mellitus. It is derived from two Greek words. I mean, it is derived from two words, diabetes and mellitus. One is Greek, another is Latin. So, diabetes is derived from the Greek word called diapenine, which means to pass through. Now, what passes through? It's as if, you know, excess urination, as if water was passing through them. That's how the name diapenine came into being, which later became diabetes. Now, mellitus is a Latin word, which means honey or sweet. You know, the urine of people with diabetes had a sweet taste and smell. So, that's how the name diabetes mellitus. Now, what is diabetes mellitus? How do you define it? These are group of metabolic disorders which share the common feature of hyperglycemia. Okay. So, this is very important. Presence of hyperglycemia and this hyperglycemia is caused either by defects in the insulin secretion 
or by defects in the action of insulin or the combination of both of these right defects in insulin secretion defects in insulin action or the combination of both these factors so that is how you define diabetes mellitus now we need to know that the chronic hyperglycemia in diabetes mellitus along with the metabolic deregulation results in secondary damage in multiple organ systems particularly the kidneys eyes nerves and blood vessels Okay, the majority of the manifestations are because of involvement of these organs. In the United States alone, the diabetes is the leading cause of end-stage renal disease. This is the leading cause of adult onset blindness and non-traumatic lower extremity amputations. Now let's let's look into the epidemiological aspects as per World Health Organization. In the year 2015, way back, this is a decade earlier, 8.5% of adults aged 18 years and older had diabetes. That is roughly around 422 million of the population had diabetes. In 2019, diabetes was the direct cause of around 1.5 million deaths. And 48% of deaths due to diabetes occurred before the age of 70 years. Remember, India and China, you know, they are the largest contributors to the world's diabetic burden. Now, how do you diagnose diabetes? First and foremost, you need to understand what is the normal blood sugar level, which is 70 to 120 milligram per deciliter. Now, the diagnostic criteria for diabetes mellitus, as per American Diabetic Association and the World Health Organization, it includes one. A fasting plasma glucose more than or equal to 126 mg per deciliter. A random plasma glucose more than or equal to 200 mg per deciliter, particularly in the patient with having classic hyperglycemic signs. You know, you have polyuria, polydipsia and polyphagia. These are classic hyperglycemic signs. In those patients, if the, if the blood sugar level is more than 200 or equal to 200, then you can consider that this could be having diabetes. Or oral glucose tolerance test you know, with a loading dose of 75 grams, a 2 hour plasma glucose is more than 200 milligram per deciliter. Or the glycosylated hemoglobin level, that is H, HbA1c level, more than 6.5%. Right? So remember, in a patient with classic hyperglycemic signs, these three, the first one, the third one and the fourth one, except the random plasma glucose more than or equal to 200 milligram. These three, if you find these values, it has to be repeated and confirmed again on a different day for you to make a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. Now, there is a condition called pre-diabetes. What is this pre-diabetes? It is a state of dysglycemia which often precedes the development of a frank diabetes, particularly the type 2 diabetes. We'll talk about the types of diabetes a bit later. So, just remember that you need to have one or more of the following features. What are those features? One, fasting plasma glucose between 100 and 125 milligram per deciliter because we know if it is 126, that is diabetic, diabetes mellitus. And this glucose level is known as impaired fasting glucose. Okay, this is one. Second one, a 2-hour plasma glucose between 140 to 199. You no, know, And that is after you know, a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. This particular entity is referred to as impaired glucose tolerance. Right. Now, why it is important for us to know impaired glucose tolerance? Because these are the patients who will eventually develop diabetes over five years. Particularly, you know, if the patient is obese and if he or she has family history, then it compounds the risk of development of diabetes. And the pre-diabetes also has a very significant risk of cardiovascular complications. Now let's look into the classification of diabetes mellitus into type 1 diabetes mellitus and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this is the broad category of diabetes mellitus where type 1 is the autoimmune disease where the pancreatic beta cell destruction takes place and the deficiency of insulin is absolute because the beta cells are destroyed which are the ones which secrete insulin right. So there is absolute deficiency of insulin. 
whereas type 2 diabetes mellitus is you have insulin but then there is resistant resistance to insulin action so peripheral resistance to insulin action is the feature of type 2 diabetes mellitus you know where the response by the pancreatic b cells you know that is inadequate to overcome insulin resistance so which means there is relative insulin deficiency as com uh, in contrast to the absolute one in type 1 diabetes mellitus now 5 to 10 percent of the diabetes is type 1 around 90 to 90 percent 95 percent of diabetes is of type 2 type okay the type 1 diabetes is most often younger individuals less than 20 years of age whereas type 2 it can be seen in adults adolescents and children as well but it is predominantly adult onset diabetes mellitus but Remember, it can also be seen in ad adolescents and children. Majority of these individuals are overweight. Let us see uh, in detail about the classification of the diabetes mellitus. We know that the type 1 is beta cell destruction, usually leading to absolute, whereas type 2 is relative insulin deficiency, right? The type 1 is immune mediated or idiopathic, which is autoantibody negative type. So, it is more often an autoimmune destruction of beta cells. Whereas type 2 diabetes mellitus can further be categorized into, it could be because of genetic defects of beta cell function, it could be because of genetic defects in insulin action, could be exocrine pancreatic defects. This is called pancreato pancreatogenic or type 3C diabetes. It can be because of endocrinopathies. Infections can result in type 2 diabetes. Some of the drugs are implicated in type 2 diabetes. There are syndromes which are associated with type 2 diabetes. And lastly, diabetes occurring in pregnancy, the gestational diabetes mellitus. Let us see what are the defects in B cell function. The most uh, you know, common example we, uh, we think about is the most common example which is given is maturity onset diabetes of the young which is called MODY where there are mutations of various en genes encoding enzymes and these mutations could be MODY1, MODY2, MODY3, 2, 6. That is the cause for maturity onset diabetes of the young. It can be neonatal diabetes where the mutations are basically in KCNJ11 gene and ABCC8 gene. There is maternally inherited diabetes and deafness MIDD where there is mutations of the mitochondrial DNA. Remember all these things are defects of beta cell function and lastly there can be mutations in the insulin gene itself. So, these are the first category of type 2 diabetes mellitus. The second category where there is genetic defects in insulin action, that means there is type A insulin resistance or second one is known as lipoatrophic diabetes mellitus. The third one is exocrine pancreatic defects. So we know that the pancreas is composed of endocrine component and exocrine component, right? Now what are the exocrine diseases which can result in type 2? It would be chronic pancreatitis, it could be trauma to the pancreas or pancreatectomy, it could be cancers of pancreas, cystic fibrosis, hemochromatosis, which can secondarily affect, affect the pancreas, and finally fibrocalculus pancreatopathy. All these things can result in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Endocrinopathies, various endocrine diseases like acromegaly, Cushing syndrome, hyperthyroidism, pheochromocytoma, you know, glucogonoma, all these can result in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Infections, particularly the cytomegalovirus infections, the Coxsackie B virus infection, congenital rubella, all these, are, all these viral infections, you know, they destroy the pancreatic beta cells. Now, there are certain drugs which are implicated in diabetes mellitus which include as common as glucocorticosteroids, your normal steroid hormones, steroid injections, steroid tablets, they can result in type 2 diabetes mellitus, thyroid hormone supplementation, interferon alpha, beta adrenergic agonists, you know, thiazide diuretics, phenytoin, which is very commonly used in epilepsy, all these can result in the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. 
Now, what are the syndromes associated? It could be Down syndrome, very common genetic syndrome, right? The Down syndrome, the Kleinfelter syndrome, Turner syndrome and trader willi syndrome. All these things can have secondary diabetes, that is type 2 diabetes mellitus. And lastly, gestational diabetes mellitus, which occurs in pregnancy. The diabetes, adult onset diabetes or the type 2 diabetes mellitus, which occurs during pregnancy, that is known as gestational diabetes mellitus. So, this is how you categorize type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus, right? So, that's all for today's session. We talked about the general aspects of the pancreas, particularly the endocrine pancreas, the cells and the functions, the definition epidemiology, the diagnostic criteria and classification of diabetes. Now, if you have listened to the entire topic, I would suggest you to click on the link for the practice sessions via Visdolia in the description as well as in the pinned comment. Now, you can solve the multiple choice questions. You can even answer clinical scenario based questions that the, the understanding of topics becomes much better, right? And if you like this platform, consider subscribing. And if you want to subscribe, use the code I love pathology 33 for a 33 percent discount on the subscription. Remember, you do get instant feedback if you go wrong while solving these questions. Thank you for watching. If you have liked this video, hit the like button. Do comment, don't forget to subscribe and please do share if you find this video useful. In the next session, let us understand the concepts of glucose metabolism so that we will have a greater understanding of diabetes. So, stay tuned.